roll with it. Okay. Now it's spinning. Okay. Yep, Are we back? Yes. All right. Here we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am uh, Kate Morrison. I work with eRes Life Software, and I'm here today to talk to you about student staff hiring, as um, Becca said. And so I'm going to turn off my camera because, you know, nobody needs to see my face and my thinking face, but um, hopefully you enjoy the presentation. And like Becca said, uh, I'll take any and all questions at the end. So here we go. Um, so today we're looking at staff hiring, and I think um, all of us are looking for kind of that magic formula that one one that gives us kind of a diverse staff team that's awesome and void of progressive discipline meetings. Um, that would be the dream. So I'm here to tell you that I don't have that formula. Um, what I am here to talk to you about are the four traits of successful staff members that are rooted in data. So from that data, we're, we're going to turn it over to you so that you can do the work. I'm going to walk you through the traits, how they were identified, um, and ways to adjust or rethink your recruitment and selection processes to market and select candidates who show these traits. Because I don't know what's happening at your individual institutions, uh, you'll be asked to reflect on your own experiences as we move through the presentation. Um, but first, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for the countless hours that you spent planning a safe return to campus. Thank you for those countless other duties as assigned you've been completing over the last six months. Um, I know that a lot of your work is often met without recognition or praise, um, yet you continue to showcase your resilience and dedication to your students, so thank you for that. Your work is significant, the work you're doing matters, um, and the work you're doing is noticed. So as I said, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Kate Morrison. Um, I live in Vancouver, British Columbia. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I started off, I'm going to tell you about my journey through residence life because I think that plays into how I approach student staff hiring. Um, and so I started out in um, residence life as an RA. I did that in a traditional residence style hall for two years. After doing that, I became a residence coordinator and was responsible for six student staff. Um, fast forward a few years and taking a little bit of a break from higher education, I became a residence life manager at the University of British Columbia. Uh, that's kind of equivalent to an area coordinator for first year residence area that housed just over 1,400 residence students. <clears throat> In that position, I was responsible for 49 student staff members. After that, I became the Associate Director of Residence Life at UBC um, and focused primarily on the first year experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. So part of that role was facilitating a hiring and selection process for over 600 potential candidates. Um, and now I'm at eRes Life Software. One of the reasons, I mean, a lot of people ask me, why did you move from kind of higher education into the private sector? I was drawn to eRes Life because it, they do focus on community and the desire to give back to the industry. Um, and so for me, it was just a matter of, I needed a little bit of a break from the day to day in residence life. Um, but I do hope to make it back to higher education at some point. So a little bit about eRes Life, I won't go into this in much detail, um, but like I said, they are, we are a client-focused um, software provider. We approach our work through the lens of what would we do if we were still in the industry. All of our staff members have worked in higher ed at some point in their career. Um, our system covers a lot of areas, residential education and campus life, housing assignments, facilities, um, but the staff selection tool is the one I'm going to highlight today. We do have a system that allows you to collect data very easily, which is one of the things I'll focus on today. Um, but it does give you kind of a holistic picture of the student and their experience at your institution. So that's kind of how I am connected in today. Um, and one of the things eRes Life does try to do is establish partnerships with other industry providers that allow us to better serve, <coughs> excuse me, our community. And so we have partnered with Sky Factor Benchworks, formerly EBI, and um, 
to get a sense of how their assessments are going and what information can we draw from there. And so Sky Factor does a number of assessments. Um, the two that I took a look at and worked with Sky Factor on to come up with this presentation are the resident assessment um, and particularly looking at 246 institutions with that and the student staff assessment, which looked at 41 institutions. So some of the information that was extrapolated from that on-campus residents were more likely to report high satisfaction with their RA than any other factor of, on the, in the resident assessment. The top predictor of resident satisfaction with an RA was resident satisfaction with hall programming. I found that one particularly interesting at the point in time we're at right now. Um, obviously, this data is not from um, 2020. And so I'm curious to see what the top predictor of resident satisfaction will be as we look at 2020 data. Um, but very fascinating to me that that um, overall resident satisfaction was predicted by hall programming and the satisfaction there. Um, and while satisfaction with hall programming was the top predictor, um, other factors also played into that. So the top five are diverse and personal interactions, um, a sense of community, which is no surprise to anyone here, safety, which again, I'm sure plays a part even more in 2020, and the hall environment. So what kind of um, both structural and personal environment is there? Um, and as the number, and again, this will not come to a surprise to anyone in residence life, but as the number of times in a typical week a resident interacted with their RA, um, as that number increased, so did the scores on their satisfaction survey. So obviously, more engagement with an RA equals more resident satisfaction. And as the number of times in a typical week a resident interacted with their RA increased, um, the, the students reported on all factors higher scores. So, our, and then switching gears a little bit over to the RA experience, RAs who are highly satisfied with their job requirements and compensation were more likely to rate their overall experience higher than um, other RAs. So that was a key factor in why, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just gonna grab a sip of water. <clears throat> so as I was saying, RAs satisfied with job requirements and what was expected of them and the equivalent compensation had a better experience. RAs who rated their overall experience more highly um, were more likely to score um, higher on learning outcomes. So key learning outcomes that, were, that are part of the Sky Factor assessment, if they were um, satisfied with their overall experience, those were higher. A relationship with other RAs was also a strong indicator of RA satisfaction, even more so than the supervisor RA relationship. That one to me was like a little bit surprising, not really surprising, but that there was so much, um, that it was so much stronger than that supervisor experience. So this information should inform your processes. I'm confident that you feel more fulfilled and have a greater desire to get up in the morning and do a great job when you're satisfied with your work. And I think RAs are no different. So by understanding the information and what drives successful RAs, we can better hire and support our student staff teams and create a satisfying environment for our students. So that's kind of the foundation for this presentation um, and where we were able to extrapolate more information. So here's the, the meat of the presentation. These are the four traits that came and emerged from the data. Um, so sense of accountability, consistency in action, ability to connect to others, and the desire to improve. So these four factors um, were directly related to those RAs that were more satisfied in their role and deemed more successful by their residents. So I, I'm confident in looking at those that none of you will see those as a surprise. Um, but what you may not have done before is put these traits into words like this. So I'm just curious, how does that resonate for you? And I think, take a minute and think about that. Do you think these traits hold true on your campus? Um, when you think back to top performers, do you see these traits in them? You feel free to add your thoughts to the chat if you'd like. I can't see them right now because of how my screen's situated, but you're welcome to do that. And we can connect on that later. Um, I know personally, when I think back on my experience, even though, you know, working directly with student staff 
was 15 years ago, I held these desires, um, or I, I saw all of these desires. Um, and even when I was when I was an RA, I think I had all of these like these traits, I even wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a good RA. <laughs> like I maybe was mediocre um, or average, but I don't think I was great. And so well, even as someone who was middle of the road, I think I had these traits. Um, but that said, um, I had the drive to improve and to get better. And so I think that's what we're all trying to do. Um, I, in thinking about this presentation and thinking about these traits, I struggle to think which one or figure out, and maybe we shouldn't even be doing that, which of them is, is most impactful. And if I'm being completely honest, um, I think these even resonate with professional staff. Um, if I wanted to be able to trust one of my staff members, um, I wanted to know that you were going to do what you said you were going to do. I don't want to be surprised by your decisions and I wanted you to learn and grow. So I don't, I, while I think these traits are proven by data to show that they um, are predictors of a good IRA, I think that can also be translated over to professional staff or grad students. So looking ahead, how do these um, change your perspective or your approach to staff supervision or your selection process. And I think specifically this year with a more socially distanced role, how do these manifest? So for example, consistency and accountability. I'm sure in the past, like those were very easy to monitor and evaluate, but those become even more paramount when you can't observe or run into your staff members in the same way. Additionally, without the ability to host staff meetings and socials in the same way, how can we ensure that teams have the foundations that need to be effective? Um, I used to rely a lot on Tuckman's stages of team development when thinking about teams in the time of year. And I would guess that at this point in the year, a lot of teams are like moving into the storming phase where maybe you're getting frustrated with other people or that honeymoon phase has kind of moved past and you're, you're looking um, more critically at your team members and so how do we have those conversations to get past that and um, encourage that ability to connect with others in our teams um, and how does that sense of accountability and connection to others play in when the team member is forced into a quarantine room or to self-isolate similarly how do we connect with those students who are quarantined or self-isolated um, does this change when they've made the decision to put themselves in a vulnerable situation um, and how do we monitor that so I think those are some things to consider as we move forward and build teams with RAs that have these qualities so I always encourage, when, since working at Ebrez Life, I've learned the value of looking back to move forward. And so how do we use our past experiences to inform our current decisions or our proactive decisions? So where can you access other resources that might help you create a process that makes sense in knowing now these four traits? Where do you gather information that builds, up the, builds upon the success of others? So I'm not going to read out these things on the screen. You can read them yourself. I know that. Um, but all of the things there provide us with data. If they're documented in a clear and centralized way, it makes it even easier for us to obtain that information. But that said, using past data and experiences can help a department find holes or gaps in their current process. So let's use, uh, let's use mid hires and departures as an example things to think about. What were the reasons for those departures? How was the performance of those who left? Um, did those individuals show signs of those four traits we just talked about? If so, were you or your department not providing opportunities to foster those traits? Or did they leave because they'd already established proficiency in those traits in that role? For example, if a returner indicated they had no opportunities for growth, do you think that's true? Are there actually no opportunities for growth? And so as a result, the staff member left mid-year. Or is it more a matter of rethinking how learning opportunities or growth opportunities are framed and so that the staff member can see those experiences a little bit differently? And what about the staff that came in to replace them? How were they selected? Were they off a wait list from your initial hiring or did you open up applications again? How was their performance? Were they able to connect to others in the same way? Did they equally have um, 
opportunities for growth at their level, so meeting students where they're at, even though they were hired on a different timeline. So I think those kind of things play into um, moving forward and being successful in terms of um, RAs and what traits are there. As we think back to those seven key insights from Sky Factor, you'll remember that relationships with RAs were a strong indicator of RA satisfaction, stronger than that supervisor relationship. So equally, how do we ensure that these members feel included? All of the insights are connected. Um, and so more satisfied as an RA, more likely to be present and greater satisfaction for residents. So in closing on this slide, I think it's just important that you have the data there. Um, so you have information, whether it's anecdotal, whether it's just um, from your staff, your professional staff that have been there a couple years, or if you do have written documented data, it's there. So looking at that as you're moving forward to make decisions. So moving on to uh, recruitment and selection, we looked back and did some assessment in the last slide, and now so we're going to pivot and think ahead. I was <laughs> curious if y'all uh, cringed when I said pivot, because that seems to be the word of 2020, and people don't like it anymore. Um, but what can you do in each of these areas to better inform your candidates and help a selection process be more effective? So does the trait... Um, do those traits change your perspective or your approach to staff supervision or your selection process? What can you do in each of these areas to better inform your selection process and have it be more effective? So think about the role as we move forward. What's changed? What's the same? And how can we use those changes to our advantage? We're going to walk through each of these steps in more detail, and as we do, I challenge you to think about the opportunities for growth and improvement for staff, the ways they can connect to each other. How will you hold staff accountable and ensure consistency as you may find yourself with some new marketing and training opportunities? Marketing. So, how do you appeal to the traits in your marketing? So, again, in framing this in the next four slides, just thinking about the traits of an RA and what makes them successful, start at that marketing phase. And so if you think about the life cycle of an RA and you think about that, that time when they first seriously consider becoming an RA, how do we get the people that we want on our teams to actually take note of that recruitment effort or that marketing effort. And so by starting at that point, hopefully by the time you get to the selection phase and the training phase and the actual work phase, um, you've recruited the right people. And so what are we doing to promote and attract candidates with these skills? How will you use this information about those four traits to get a better applicant pool or a more diverse applicant pool or whatever you're looking for. Maybe your analysis or your assessment of past information said, yeah, we have great success with consistency, accountability, and the ability to connect with others. We don't really find a lot of people who have a desire to learn. And so you may consider a marketing campaign for your RAs um, this year that maybe appeals to people who have a desire to learn and improve. So you could do something like talk to current RAs or have our current RAs talk about the connection they have to community and how the role has helped them feel connected. That would, you know, appeal to that sense of connection or the ability to connect to others. You could have them share personal stories, that kind of thing. It also plays into the emotional component, which could be successful, but another angle you, you could play into is that desire to improve. So rethinking it, maybe part of your recruitment strategy is interviewing potential employers and letting applicants know what transferable skills they'll attain and they'll achieve by the end of the process. Um, one of the things when I was working at UBC that we started was having actually past alumni um, from our RA teams come back. So we had an alumni panel and it was a range of people, you know, everything from 20 years out to two years out to talk about where they use their skills today. And so I think the power of knowing, you know, I learned, I always use broken record technique because it's my favorite repeating things over and over until someone actually changes their behavior. That one came up with an alumni who was 20 years out from being an RA and said, I still use this tactic today. 
it works especially well when returning things at stores. And I was like, that is great. That is a life skill that you've developed, you've learned, you've practiced in a safe environment with the help of a supervisor. And in theory, or with the hope that you have mastered that skill by the time you choose to leave. So rather than focusing on those skills that you need to have to be successful in the role, shift those job descriptions and those marketing campaigns to showcase the skills that might be acquired or developed. How powerful could it be to let a student know that when they leave, they will have something that will help them later in life or help them get that job that they're looking for. So that's kind of just a little bit of an example on shifting the thinking. So again, consider how you're um, promoting and attracting using those traits. The candidate pool. So um, this one is probably a little bit different depending on if you assess your candidate pool or if everyone is invited for an interview. Um, if you invite everyone, it's a little bit different. I think I would ask if you use your application. So when students are applying, are they answering questions? Are they simply submitting their name and, you know, classier um, faculty, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're asking for more than that and you're interviewing everyone, where are you using that information? And if you're not using it, what is the point of asking it? And so I think that it's important to utilize all of the information that you're getting to make educated decisions about the staff members that you have. Um, if you are um, selecting candidates for interviews, what rubrics are you using? So again, using the information that's provided to you in a, a really applicable way. One of the things that I've noticed since starting at ERES Life is that um, the desire to obtain cover letters and even resumes has gone down significantly in hiring processes um, and more and more we're seeing essay style applications where a student has the choice between three potential essay questions and that's how they're choosing to hire because more and more we're seeing that trend of students don't have prior work experience but they do have life skills um, that don't always show up on, an, on a resume so how can we assess that? Um, and how can we develop rubrics that play into those four traits that were mentioned to accurately assess those candidates that are coming in. I think it's important to think about the power of growth mindset in hiring as well. Um, so while candidates might ha not have qualifications yet, is there the potential for them to grow and develop those qualifications? Again, appealing to that desire to learn um, and look for ways to develop staff to provide something to them as well beyond kind of that financial or compensation piece. It's also important um, with those essay questions, you can find things, threads or themes with those other traits. So you could look for ways they've shown accountability um, or consistency in action. So I think the questions that you ask on your application and how you use those answers can be fundamental to the success of your process. So again, like I mentioned before, rubrics are kind of the key there and objective hiring um, can be difficult when you're working with large numbers or working with multiple people as evaluators. So um, thinking about, or one of the things I've heard or seen recently are kind of an evaluation that's based on check marks. So there's kind of three goals that anyone would answer in an essay question. And if you answer all of those three goals within your answer, you would get three points if you get two, two, whatever. Um, and so then you're actually assessing based on things that came out of the answer, not on was this a good answer or not, or were there spelling and grammar um, errors, that can actually like lead to more bias and privilege <clears throat> anyway. And so we kind of want to stay away from the spelling and grammar thing and actually assess the content of what is being written. So for example, if a candidate is able to articulate that they're interested in the position because they want to grow their assertiveness skills and improve on their public speaking abilities, that person may get to move to the next round. They've identified um, areas for growth and improvement and also, um, you know, trainable, achievable skills that you and that individual can work with. If they've shared an example of working at McDonald's for and, and know, and in that answer, they talk about how they learned the process to complete things as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, 
don't fault them for doing a repetitive task for three years, for example. It shows consistency in action. So they're working on those ability to do a consistent task and establish consistency with other team members. Um, if you're not getting these types of answers that give you that kind of information, perhaps it is time to look at your application and what, um, what you're going for. I've asked a couple of our community members, like, why don't you ask for a cover letter anymore? Most of the replies come back with something to the extent of most 18 to 21 year olds don't actually have the skills to write a cover letter. Um, and so by asking pointed questions, you get to more um, of the answers that you want. And so we see a lot of questions like, tell me about your typical role on a team, which I know has been asked in interviews in the past, but actually having that on your application can also showcase um, how your, your different candidates view team or let us know about a goal you've set for yourself and how, um, and how you've worked to achieve that goal. Again, and often an interview question now put into an essay format where a st student or a candidate has the ability to think, to reflect, um, and to take time to process how they want to articulate that answer. Um, so th these <coughs> questions or these kind of questions will give you further insight into the accountability, the ability to connect, and the desire to learn. So kind of we're flipping it again, thinking backwards, moving forward. Interviewing. Um, so interviewing isn't that much different, um, knowing the traits or not. I think it comes down to what types of questions you're asking and how can you get the most authentic answers from your candidate. I'm sure we've all been on interviews where you feel like the answer was rehearsed or someone anticipated what they thought you wanted them to say and you got that answer as well, therefore not getting a great glimpse into the candidate. Um, so I think something like what aspects of the position are you most looking forward to can give you great insight into whether or not a candidate holds these four traits. If they're looking, like I said in the last example, to develop their public speaking, that could be a great area of improvement for people. Um, if they're looking to connect with students, again, great opportunity to connect with others and that kind of thing. Um, Another great question to ask is what things or people inspire you um, that can tie into that sense of accountability or what should people think about you that can give you a lot of insight into um, those traits and how people view positions and their role. Um, so you want to look at your process and your questions to determine if your assessment of candidates will give you a glimpse into their goals, traits, aspirations, and if those align with your needs. Um, I encourage you to focus on empathy-based questions. We, if you're curious on what those are or some examples, I have those listed on our eRes Life blog, so you can go there. Um, but those allow your candidate to share a story that showcases their personality and allows them to be themselves. So again, getting to the root of who someone is will help you understand if they kind of have those four traits. Um, interviewing also requires trust on your team. And so looking back at past hires and seeing if any patterns emerge, has someone in the past been a harder evaluator? Did someone else go easy on people? Was there a tendency to hire people from a certain evaluator and not from another, um, just based on you know personality conflicts on teams and that sort of thing? Did you actually use scores if you were scoring things? Um, so did you use the score from the interview and what other factors played into that? So was it solely an interview score? It's a one shot, that's your only opportunity and nothing else matters? Or did you use references um, and other things like their application, references, interview, that kind of thing. Um, what about the references from their current RA? If they were living in one of your buildings, did the RA have the opportunity to provide feedback? Um, I personally think this is a, a piece that is missing and it's harder when you have some students from off campus applying and so figuring that out might be a, a challenge on your campus. But someone who has seen that individual for four months or six months probably has better um, and more authentic comments on their ability and their traits than someone who um, only saw them for 10 minutes in an interview session. So again, thinking about how those are 
evaluated ties into rubrics. And that's kind of my next point. Um, a lot of interviews processes I've seen have a focus on taking a lot of notes so you can come back to the notes and evaluate the content from those notes. The interesting thing with notes is you can never document everything <laughs> that's happened um, or being said. There are also different people choose to document different things. Um, and so notes are kind of, they're helpful to kind of trigger the memory, but they're not the sole picture of what may be happening. So um, encouraging again, that kind of rubric or checkbox of were these points touched upon in the answer um, to kind of give a more objective viewpoint on a candidate. Um, we've also seen good success with sending questions in advance so that um, applicants are more at ease and can better prepare. Now, I know there is a bit of a divide on whether or not that's a fair and equitable process, but um, even if you sent one or two questions in advance, ask those questions first, let your candidate warm up, and then you can actually, again, see their authentic self. The last piece uh, in terms of the steps I will cover is around selection. So considering that full picture of the candidate beyond their scores and taking into account their ability or desire to grow. Often um, scores, interviews, um, applications, all of the things we've talked about are based on what the candidate holds at that time. And so again, throughout the process, thinking about what is the potential and where is the ability to grow as one of those key traits moving forward. Um, so, and how does your team balance out? So you don't want everyone with an ability to grow with no one who has maybe already those skills to be assertive or those skills to program or implement a curriculum. You need to have um, some people who are already able to do that to help alleviate that load on professional staff to teach and learn. Learning from each other, peer-to-peer -peer learning is very, very powerful. Um, and so making sure that your team is balanced out in terms of those different traits and skills. And then also looking at that selection process and where those skills and traits lie can help you address what you need to cover in training. So year to year, and again, thinking back, did you have the same training that you do every year or are there tweaks, adjustments, or new sessions that need to be added based on what your newly developed um, kind of recruitment strategy and selection strategy has been? Um, after, so after you've selected everyone, um, taking a look before you make any announcements of, is this a representative population as well? And if not, what could you do to change that? We want to foster those connections between staff as well. So how can we do that in terms of selection, placement, um, making sure that we're setting up everyone for success? I know there is a, a divide in residence life around placing returners back in their pre-existing building with, with similar or members of a team that have been there before versus spreading them out, starting new, teaching new skills to keep them engaged that way. And so thinking about based on your prior experiences, which is the best call for your institution. Um, also, when you think about training, what are you doing to acknowledge and empower the traits that we talked about? What exercises can you host before the year starts to show your staff that you're committed to learning and valuing those aspects of those traits? Um, what can you do for your management team to also give them the ability to learn and grow, um, but also hold staff accountable um, make sure that they're being consistent in their actions and that sort of thing. So I think those tie into um, our assessment pieces later. So again, it's been kind of a theme throughout this presentation, but it's important to be able to look back to be able to look for it. So again, this is a, a repeat of a past slide, but now with the assessment lens on. So moving forward, how can we use all of these things to give us more insight or more information um, and evaluate if the changes you made based on the traits are indicative of a higher functioning team. And so um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that the four traits, they might resonate for your campus, they might not. Um, 
So it's important to also think, you know, if these are not the four traits, what are? Um, but I think having that focus and that ability to um, identify kind of four or five key factors that you should be weaving throughout all of the processes will really help narrow in um, and showcase what your department is looking for. So again, you know, if you're evaluating past candidate pools, so looking at who would you identify as successful versus um, maybe not as successful as a staff? What were those predictors? So now you have those in your hiring process. Were those predictors accurate? And if not, where did those kind of gaps lie? How can you loop back to your marketing? Were there different demographics? So maybe first year students, upper year students, grad students, first generation students looking at race or even who the current RA is. Were there predictors or voids there um, that you need to kind of tweak your marketing and recruitment strategy to get next time? What needs to change to be more of a representative population in your candidate pool? Um, Mid-year hires. So how did you, how did those staff, how many did you lose over the course of the year? Was it higher or lower than in past years? Um, why did they choose to leave? So again, looking at the same questions we looked at before, but relating them back to those changes that were made and the increase of information that you have directly related to the specific traits that you've identified or the four traits that I've mentioned before. Um, similarly, with returner retention, this one's a big one in my opinion, do all of your staff want to come back? There's often a sense of if a staff member doesn't want to come back, that's a bad thing. Um, but I actually would say that having staff move on to other things is a great thing. Um, it means that they have learned, they feel more confident, hopefully, and that they're able to try new things and kind of further develop their learning. It goes along with all of those four traits that we said before. Um, and so thinking about that, how do they measure up and how are they able to articulate those traits on future applications? So there's a potential there for even more staff development in terms of, you know, we've identified these as traits that we hope staff members leave with. How can you articulate that moving forward? And how can we help you obtain the next position that will better foster your growth and hold you accountable? Um, I think it's personally, I think it's paramount that we ask returners and RAs who are leaving for more information about why they made the decision they, they, are, they did to get more information. So in that point, exit interviews and feedback um, are great, especially the exit interviews because there's no consequence for honesty. And so um, aligning your interview questions with maybe key factors that play into the four traits could really help you. So one question, for example, would be, do your RAs feel that they were held to a consistent standard? Um, I personally was criticized as a supervisor for having favorites. Um, and so that was really good learning for me in terms of finding ways to articulate that there is a consistent standard and here's how we measure that. Um, and then what needs to change as a result of that feedback? And can you implement that for the next calendar or academic year? Or do you need to um, kind of take a step back for a year, figure out what needs to change and move forward that way? Um, so questions to consider as we're wrapping up, how can data help your process? So, you know, data is broad, so we can look at the numbers um, for a lot of things and counts. You know, a lot of people I've seen assess RA successfulness by number of programs. And again, looking back at the Sky Factor information, programming was a key indicator of RA success. And so how can we tie those two things together, especially in a curriculum based approach? Like, does that change based on the RA or is it standardized across the process? But how can data help you do that? Um, where will you get your data from? How and when do you start collecting that data? Um, and then do you or how can you evolve your current process? If you've already started it, what could you do now that would help you in the future? Um, how can you involve those staff members in your process moving forward? So asking them real questions around, we've identified these four traits. What can we do to better set you 
and future staff up for success? Um, what do you need? What would be helpful? All of those questions will help you um, moving forward. And then establishing key indicators for success. This is one thing that, um, and whether it's my personal experience or across the board, in the private sector, we often use KPIs or key performance indicators to assess whether or not something was successful. We should be using those in residence life more frequently to assess whether or not things were um, successful or had an impact. I think there are ways we could do this. So what data or what information or what indicators are there of success? Um, it's very hard to determine what makes an RA successful, but looking at that and figuring out what that might be, then you can assess year to year based on your different efforts and your different approaches. Have things changed in this particular year? And then lastly, how will you assess your RA satisfaction knowing what you know now? So knowing those four traits and those four indicators, how can you move to ask students and RAs those key questions that will allow you to figure out if they're happy, satisfied, and not just at the end of their time, but thinking about the progression um, and moving forward in a way that makes sense for everyone. So that's all I have to say. Um, my email is there if you do have questions that you don't want to ask afterwards, as well as I alluded to um, the empathy questions, which are on our blog. Uh, we also have some information about trust in hiring and how you can work through that with your team on there. Um, and about in the next week or so, we're also going to be adding a bunch of questions related to less common interview questions um, and paperless hiring processes. So if you are curious, head over to the blog and you'll see that there. Um, and I will head back over to the Google chat and if there are any questions please let me know. Awesome. Thank you Kate. Um, do we have any questions? Either anyone want to shout one out or throw one in the chat? I get it. I'm not a question person in the webinar world either. So Joel, it makes sense. I'm a more process and then think ahead. So welcome any questions at any point as well. Thanks, Tess. That's kind. Anyone thinking of ways that um, they're going to change their process now as we start thinking about 21, 22. That feels weird to say out loud. But definitely fair um, because it's getting to that time of year. Um, I guess for, for Kate and the group, uh, something we've implemented at SFU at least over the past two years is uh, the rubrics being included in the interview, but there's been feedback on the details included into that rubric, whether they become too detailed on the checkboxes that student staff um, or candidates are, are trying to hit versus not enough detail that it leaves the marker um, kind of in this gray area of where do we go, what, what, what would the score be, which leads to inconsistency in, in the evaluation. Um, do you have examples or tips on rubrics that maybe you've seen or used that um, satisfies the information that you need to get from the interviews and the consistency with markers, I guess? Yeah, great question. I personally feel like the simpler version that you sp spoke of does actually net you a better result in the end. I get that it um, opens up to maybe a little bit more interpretation, but they're, when matched with a training, so I always encourage a similar to both bo bo behind closed doors kind of approach in that have all your evaluators come together, give some mock applications or interviews. So maybe there's one person that we all interview together, um, have everyone evaluate based on the rubric and then see where those inconsistencies lie because then you can kind of assess why those are happening and tweak that in advance of the actual interviews happening and you get a sense of 
of, you know, oh, shoot, I am too easy or I didn't pick up on that. Um, so having a number of those kind of mock interviews happen in a room, so spend an hour or two, will net you a, a more objective result down the road. Thank you. I can't see anyone, so I don't know what's happening, but that's fine. Awesome. Well, we can go ahead and keep hanging out if people think of questions, um, but I do want to do a quick thank you again to Kate for presenting. Um, I've also posted the feedback link in the chat, so if you want to take a minute and fill that out, that would be wonderful. Um, and then I'm going to head, go ahead and press stop recording.